Happy Sabbath. Wellness is the complete integration of body, mind, and spirit. The realization that everything we do, think, feel, and believe has an effect of our state of well-being. Greg Anderson. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker. He is definitely a person of interest. He is a father, a son, a teammate, a boss, and to many, a great friend. But to me, he will always be remembered as the big brother that took my spankings. Sorry, bro, had to throw that in there. Adrian Hargrove is a youth mentor, educational and mental health advocate, and a motivational speaker who has dedicated his life to service to others. Through his nonprofit organization, The Heart Grove, Adrian draws from experiences in his personal life as an example to get to the heart of the matter, seeking to motivate and inspire youth to recognize their strengths, overcome obstacles, and achieve their goals and dreams. Adrian also provides individual, individual group anger and emotional management counseling for teens, adults. Adrian's youth and does also does student youth workshops and employee development training. Adrian serves as a program director at the Harris Home for Children, a group home facility serving foster youth in Huntsville, Alabama. He also is the senior vice president of philanthropy and community involvement with Affinity Recruiting LLC. Adrian has earned his bachelor's degree in business administration, master's degree in public administration, and is currently earning his doctoral degree in education and organization leadership. What a role model. I honestly have so much more I can say, but at this time, I will step aside and let you be blessed and inspired. I now present to you, Adrian Hargrove, my big brother. All right, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, wait. All right, sorry, Adrian. We're gonna have our next.
mute. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that. <clears throat> Thank you, Andrea, for my introduction. I appreciate that. Um, we, we talked a little bit yesterday about the word philanthropy, and uh, she wasn't sure if she was going to try to pull that one off, but you did it, baby. <laughs> So thank you, thank you. Um, can everyone hear me? All right, get a thumbs up. Um, thank you, Ms. Howell, for the opportunity um, to speak today. Uh, I was a little nervous. I'm actually still a little nervous, but it's, it's gonna be okay. It's gonna be all right. Um, so let's open with prayer. Let's open with prayer. Uh, dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for bringing us all here together uh, to talk about you. Uh, and I just ask you to be with me today as I deliver your message. Um, speak through me, comfort me, and let's make it happen. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So the theme of uh, this month is Black Health and Wellness and Promoting Wellness in Our Community and Race. So as I tried to think about what I was going to uh, speak on today. Um, God and I had a little discussion. Uh, I I like to be very straightforward, so I'm gonna talk to you guys like like family, if that's all right. Um, I I was nervous, and you know I went to God, and you know we we have a pretty um, interesting relationship. Um, you know I talked to him pretty straight too, and I said, you know I don't. I don't know if I want to do this. I'm a little nervous. And uh, I, I was like, you know, what, what should my approach be? Um, how, should I, how should I tackle it? Uh, what type of style should I use? Um, because this is something that I've never done before. This is a first for me um, in this setting. And so, you know, in, in my mind, you know, again, with my, with my relationship with him, he kind of sat back and looked at me and said, what are you talking about? And I said, well, I, I don't, I'm not sure. What, what should I do? How, how should I approach this opportunity? How should I deliver this message? And he again kind of turned his head to the side and, and looked at me and said, what are you talking about? And I said, well, how do I do it? And he asked me, well, how did I create you to do it? And I said, well, I mean, you, you created me to be me. And he said, then be you. That's what I created you to be. And so I'm going to do this in, in a way that I only know how to do, and that's to be me, if that's all right. Um, if it's not, you can take it up with him, because that's what he said. So uh, anyway, <laughs> um, the, the Bible verse that um, motivated or or that's the foundation of my message today is uh, Jeremiah 29 11. Um, oh, I can say if you turn to your Bibles. <laughs> I always wanted to say that. Um, so I'm going to read first from the King James Version, and then I'm going to read it from the uh, NIV, which is was more of what I um, based my, my message on. So in the King James Version, Version, it says, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. The first thing that stands out to me with that is, for God knows the thoughts that he thinks about us. And as we talk about our mental health, as we talk about uh, stress and worry, which will be things that I get into a little bit later, um, at the end of the day, I, I've learned it really only matters what God thinks about me. Um, sometimes I think we, we can stress ourselves and worry ourselves about any and everything else, um, even sometimes what we think of ourselves. Um, but the most important thing is what, uh, what God thinks of us. Um, now, in the New International Version, um, it reads slightly different. Uh -oh. Um, let me pull it back up here. Technology. Jeremiah. Um, and he says, for I know the plans I have for you, 
declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and an end. Now, initially, I had titled my message, uh, We Can Because They Did, in honor of Black History Month. And I am still going to tie that into the message. But during my debate, I would say, with God, last night, um, he kind of told me to shift it just a little bit. And so the title is instead, Mind Your Plan Business. Mind Your Plan Business. Um, <laughs> you like that one, Andrew? <laughs> what is your plan? What is your plan? What is the plan that God has for your life? What did he create you to be? Why were you created in the first place? Um, the Bible says we are supposed to be the salt of the earth. We're supposed to add some flavor. We're not supposed to be bland. We're not supposed to just be here. Um, two things I love, and my, my family can tell you, anybody that knows me, I love food and music. Food and music. Um, so again, with the idea of being the, th the salt of the earth, does anybody in here like food that does not have flavor? I don't, I, don't, I don't think so. I see a lot of head shaking. I know I don't. I love flavor. Um, I actually like to cook myself. And if something doesn't have flavor, I just, I just can't take it. I don't, I don't want to eat it. Um, so as Christians, as we try to spread the word of God, as we strive to spread the word of God, we have to think about it. Am I adding any flavor? To people's lives? Am I, am I adding flavor to what I do? When, when someone takes me in, when someone's in my presence, is it a pleasant taste? Or do you leave them with a, eh, I don't, I could do without that. I'm sure we've all had that restaurant experience where we've gone in and you've had something and you leave and you're kind of like, eh, I probably won't order that again. I don't, I don't think I want to I don't want another bite of that. So in life, we have to think that as we go through our day-to-day -day lives, when we're coming into contact with people, what kind of taste are we leaving in their mouth? Do we walk away and that person says, whatever message you might've tried to share with them, I can do without that. No, that's, that's not something I'd really care to hear about. So as we, as we share our love of God, um, let's be mindful of, not just what we're saying, but, but the taste that we're leaving in the mouth of someone else. Um, again, along with food, I love a buffet. I love a good buffet. You know, I love variety. I'm not one of those people who can't have my food touch. You know, I, I, I see my, my buddy Q is in, the, is in the building and he's always posting pictures of food. <laughs> and I, sometimes I'll text it. I'm like, where is that at, man? Where, where where you get that from? Or, or we'll go to our early morning workouts at the gym and, and you know, I'm putting a little whooping on him and he got an excuse like, oh, well, you know, I, I ate, I ate a little such and such last night, man. I think I, I think I ate too much, <laughs> but I love food. I love a variety. And again, with us in our Christian walk, we're supposed to provide something different. How would you feel if you paid and went to a buffet and every dish was exactly the same? Everything was the same. You just, you like, oh, I love macaroni. I heard they got great macaroni and cheese. And you go to the first station and it's macaroni and cheese. You go to the second station and it's macaroni and cheese. You go to the third station, <laughs> you get tired of the same thing. So when God created the buffet of, of this world, when he created the buffet of, of us as a people, we're all supposed to provide something different. We're all supposed to bring something different. Um, and we'll talk about comparison later because that was something I, I battled with. But be you, be you. Um, moving on again, I love music. Along the same concept, uh, a trumpet was created to be a trumpet. If a trumpet tries to, to, to do what the drum does, it's not going to be successful. If it tries to do what the piano does, it's not going to be successful. Um, 
to all of to most of us, I would say in my age range and maybe a little younger, we spend time in the handbell choir. I remember being in the handbell choir, and you know, we're all standing there, we got the white gloves on, we we got our, you know, my little little button up, mine wore a button up shirt. I wasn't sure how to dress for the Zoom, but I said, if I don't wear a dress shirt, my mom gonna say something. But um, <laughs> I didn't do a tie though. I was rebelling a little bit. But um, I remember being in the handbell choir and you know, you're standing there and you've got your bells. You've got your, they are called bells, right? It's handbells. So you got your, your special bell and you're just waiting and you're watching the notes and you just, uh, uh, ah, ah, you just wait and you wait your turn and yours comes again and it's, ah, ah, and you wait, you got to rest it. You got to rest it because, you know, it'll, it'll go out of turn sometimes. But the point of that is you were given a special bell. God gave that to you and only you. The choir director gave that to you. And the plan was for you to play it at the right time when you were supposed to. And your bells were not like anyone else's bells in that row. Your bells brought something special. It brought something unique. And going back to minding your plan business, I could not look at someone else's sheet to find out when it was time for me to play. I had to, I had to pay attention to the plan that guy gave me or the choir director gave me. What sheet of music were you given? Not someone else's, not, not the person next to me. If, if I looked over, if I was too busy trying to see what someone else was doing, I might miss my opportunity to play. And it might throw off the whole song. It might mess up the, the music to someone else's ears. Life is no different. We have to understand that we have a role to play in someone else's salvation. If we're, again, if we're going to be the salt of the earth, we have a specific role to play, and we're not going to be able to play every single role. Um, again, me trying to figure out how I was going to talk today, uh, God said, just be you. You can't, you can't try to be anyone else. Um, I joined a speaker's academy um, to learn a little bit more about motivational speaking and doing some different things, and I remember a friend of mine in the group, um, he's a little further ahead than I am. Um, he was referencing uh, Dr. Eric Thomas, who was one of our mentors. And he was saying, he said, you know, man, I remember one time I was trying to be really passionate and I was trying to speak like E.T. And I got to a point and I tried to, you know, go in really hard and my voice cracked. <laughs> and so we laughed about it. He was just like, you know what? Everybody doesn't have to deliver a message the same way. So when we are, again, witnessing and, and trying to share our story with others, trying to share the love of God with others, we have to remember that we have, to, we have a unique way of doing that, that only we can do it. Um, and so embrace that. Embrace that uniqueness. Embrace your plan. All right. So I like to tell stories. Um, if anyone knows, excuse me. either of my parents, then you have heard a story. Um, my parents are storytellers. <laughs> and so that is something that I can say I got honestly. And I'm learning to embrace it. So a brief bit of my development as to how I, I got to where I am now um, is God put me through a test. Uh, one of my favorite speakers uh, is by the name of Inky Johnson. Um, there's two things that he said. One is, you know, sometimes God will test us to see if we want what we say we want uh, really as bad as we say we do it. And if we're going to still want that when, when the test hits, when it hits the fan, when the plan hits the fan, um, are we still going to want it? Do you, do you really want it as bad as you say you do? And then he also says to understand where we came from gives us the ability to have a better understanding of where we're capable of going. Um, 
my senior year, no, my junior year in college. Um, I left Huntsville, Alabama. I transferred out to California uh, to Pacific Union College and I was ready to drop out. After my, my junior year, um, I, I had gone through some things. I had gone through some discrimination. I had gone through what, what I would say uh, was a little bit of racism, possibly. Um, however, there was also an accountability factor that played into that. Um, I didn't always make it to class. Um, you know, sorry, mom, dad, and everybody. Um, <laughs> I didn't always make it to class, you know. Um, I didn't always put forth my best effort uh, when it came to doing my, my schoolwork. I, I didn't always uh, behave the way I should have behaved. You know, I wasn't always consistent uh, in some of those things. And, you know, to some professors, you know, they wanted to work with you and others, um, not so much. Um, I'll never forget, I had one professor in particular. Um, he never looked me in the face. I remember going into his office several times to, you know, ask for help, um, usually towards the end of the semester when I realized I wasn't going to pass. Um, but he never really looked up at me. And I remember one day he said, you know, maybe college just isn't for you. And, and it really struck me like, what you mean college not for me? And so I went home that summer. Um, I had been placed on academic probation and I had to appeal to get back in school. That was gonna be the process. I had to write a letter um, of appeal and say, hey, you know, give me another shot basically. So that summer I came home, I packed up my car, drove from California back to Huntsville, Alabama. And I remember sitting and having a conversation with my great grandmother, Lucille Jones. And again, when we, when we know where we come from, we have a better understanding of where we're capable of going. Um, I knew where I came from. We knew the history of the South. Um, we knew the history of our people. Um, but I had not, I had not made it my own. I had not made it my own. And so I remember sitting in the room with my great grandmother. Um, she was suffering from diabetes. Uh, she had just uh, lost both of her legs, I wanna say right below the knee. And this was a different woman that I, I remember seeing growing up. Um, Big Ma was the one who made sure you always ate. You know, I never forget my, my cousin and I, uh, Corey, we'd be over her house and she's always making us eat something. Come in here and eat. We're like, Big Mom, we just ate. Get in here and eat. I cooked. <laughs> so we go in and eat again. Q, you would have loved it. Um, <laughs> we, we, we ate again. And, you know, she was just always moving, always moving. I, I, never, I never recalled her not being active. Um, a, a, a funny memory that Corey and I have, uh, she would fall asleep watching church all the time. <laughs> She'd fall asleep watching church. It didn't matter what denomination or what it was, she was going to watch church. <laughs> and we remember turning down the volume on the TV and we would try to change the channel and she would always wake up. I was watching that. Like, you weren't, you've been asleep for like 20 minutes. But something that was interesting about that, she had an awareness. She had an awareness about what was going on around her. And if something changed, she adjusted. We have to be aware of what's going on around us. And sometimes when things change, we, have to, we might have to show a little bit more alertness and, and make an adjustment. So, you know, again, I'm, I'm having this conversation with, with Big Ma and I, I'm just pouring out my little heart. I said, Big Ma, I don't wanna go back. I don't wanna write the letter. These people don't like me. Um, they're giving me a hard time. And I'm just, I'm just frustrated. I really don't wanna write the letter. 
I don't know, the, the, the man saying maybe school's not, you know, school isn't for everybody. And so in, in all of her wisdom, and I love this, and, and I've actually, I've actually taken this on in my own, as one of my own methods when I'm working with youth. She never criticized me. She never put me down. She didn't say anything negative. And again, um, in our Christian walk, when we're sharing God's word, when we're sharing God's love, we have to be mindful of how we're approaching people. If the first thing we have to say out of our mouth is something negative, then that's that restaurant you go to that you really don't want to go back in. You know, that's that lack of flavor. The first thing out of her mouth was like, she told me a story. It's in my blood. So I got to tell stories. <laughs> it's where I came from. So she told me a story. She said, you know, I remember growing up, um, I want to say it was Tennessee. Uh, my dad will definitely correct me if, if I got that one. <laughs> but it was in the South, <laughs> growing up in the South. And she talked about um, not having the opportunity to learn how to read, not having the opportunity um, to have books. Um, those types of things were just not the norm. You just couldn't be an African-American person at that time just walking around with a book like it was all good um learning how to read learning how to write um going to school i think i think there was an opportunity that she mentioned that came about when it was either she could go to school or she could get some type of learning but um her mother said no because they had to work um in the in the cotton field and in the cotton gin and for the, for the individual they were working for. So it wasn't even an opportunity for her. And she said that during the winter, the family that she worked for would put newspaper over the windows to kind of help prevent the, the wind and the draft from coming in. And she said through that, she would kind of start learning how to, um, you know, learning letters and learning how to, to, to pronounce certain things. and. At the end of her message, she said that she learned how to write her name and she said she had the common sense that God gave her. And so after she said that, she kind of sat back, turned her head to the side and kind of gave me that same look that I feel God gave me last night during our debate. And she was just kind of like, so now what? And in that message, in her voice, in her story, I felt so ashamed. I felt really embarrassed because I'm sitting here in a college situation, in a college dorm, um, in my dorm at PUC, just to, just to kind of get, it was like a tropical rainforest looking out my dorm window, um, which, you know, in my defense, that's one of the things that made it tough to go to class sometimes. I was... I wanted to take in the beauty that God had given me the opportunity to, to, to have there. I'm like, you know, this, this is beautiful. I'm, I'm, I am embracing and acknowledging God's beautiful creation um, of nature. Sometimes there would be deer outside. Um, it was amazing. But, um, you know, moving on, we, we've passed that. We've, we've grown past that. Um, but I was sitting there thinking, how disrespectful was it for me to sit here and complain, saying that my life was hard? And again, tying that into where we came from, um, those that came before us sacrificed so much for us to be where we are. Um, and sometimes I, I even have to remind myself now, how disrespectful is it for me to complain? for me to worry, um, but my test became my testimony. So after talking with Big Ma, I, I'm, um, oh, and, and our last thing that she said be before I left the room, she basically challenged me. And again, she said, 
I learned how to write my name and God gave me the common, I have the common sense that God gave me. And it was almost a challenge. Now it's up to you to do the rest. It was like a pass of the baton in that moment. It's like a, a, a relay race of life. Those that came before us, they ran their race and they've gotten us to a certain point as a people. And they passed the baton to us and now it's time for us to continue. That was one of the reasons that I decided that I would go for my doctorate. Is I said, you know what? I'm gonna go as far as I possibly can. What is, what is the highest level of education? She wasn't able to. Otherwise, she would have. I'm, I, without a doubt, I'm certain she would have if she had been given the opportunity. And so when she reached the end of her race, I felt like at that time she passed me the baton and I had to continue running from there. Now, just because we've made that commitment, that decision to run, doesn't mean that there aren't going to be some hurdles on the track. So once I decided to, to go back to school, packed up the car, I was like, oh yeah, going back, got my mind right, I got my motivation, I got my, my grandma, big mom behind me, pushing me, cheering me on, and I started driving out to California. I'm making great time, I'm flying, I got my music going, hair is the wind blowing through my hair, I'm just excited. And about halfway, not even halfway, three-fourths of the way through my trip, my car broke down. My car broke down in the middle of the Mojave Desert. In the middle of the Mojave Desert. And, excuse me, I'm sitting there like, now, Lord, we had another one of those conversations that we, that, you know, he and I had. You know, I, I, I sit back in my seat and I'm like, what's, what's going on here? Like this, this isn't part of the plan. This, this, no, this isn't part of the plan. Now back to the Bible verse, because I had to break it down a little bit. And sometimes when we read the Bible, I think we have to take a step back and not just read it from our understanding but read it from what is God really saying? And so I'm sitting there and, you know, God not, well, well, he was listening. I was talking and I was saying, this isn't part of the plan. Like, no, why is my car breaking down in the middle of this desert after Big Ma just gave me the speech? You know, my family all hyped me up. Everybody's cheering for me. I'm, I'm going out here. I got my mind right now. I'm back focused. This isn't part of the plan. But as the Bible verse says, he says, for I know the plan I have for you. He didn't say he was going to tell me every part of the plan. He said, I know the plan. I just need you to trust me. And I think sometimes as we're going through life, we don't know the plan. And so we start stressing out. We start panicking instead of trusting. I think one of the greatest things that happened from myself and my relationship with God was becoming a parent. Becoming a parent changed so much for me because as a parent, I know I'm not going to let my child starve, but they will ask you a thousand and seventeen times, are we going to eat? And I'm sitting there like, have you ever not eaten? What do you mean, are we going to eat dinner? Yes, of course. But I remember times where my daughter would just be in the car like life is over because we haven't eaten yet. All along, I know I have a plan for dinner. I know what I'm going to make. It's already taken care of. Relax. And I think sometimes we forget that we are God's children. And we're panicking and we're worrying. And he's like, I got a plan. I already know how I'm going to take care of it. Relax. Stop stressing out. And so as I'm sitting there in the car, in the desert, I'm like, 
Lord have mercy. <laughs> what, is, what is we going to do? Now, something else that's really interesting about the desert is during the day, it is extremely hot. But at sunset, there's an extreme shift in temperature. So I went from sitting in the desert where it was about 110 to the sun setting and it being, I want to say it was almost below 50. And so I'm like, this is, this is not it. This is, this, is, this is not it. Again, this is not part of the plan. Now, something else interesting happened, and I actually just figured this out last year. I was about a mile away from a mile marker, and I was about 15 or 20 miles past the other one. Now, it's not a mile marker, but it was a, another marker. But what that did was it marked off jurisdiction. So I had an officer come and, you know, he was just like, hey, you know, it's about to be sunset. I can't leave you here. And I was just like, well, um, at the time, you know, I'm like, someone's coming, you know, they're going to come get me and, and we're going to get towed and so on and so forth. And he's like, well, again, I can't leave you out here after sunset because, again, where I was located, which I found out later, was near one of the ramps where the 18-wheelers, if they lose control, they, they go off the road. Um, so he said, I can't leave you here because if one of those trucks come through here, you know, it'll wipe your car out. And so I was like, well, you know, where's the nearest, you know, place you could take me to? Now, again, I was, and it was less than a mile because I could see it. I was less than a mile from the next marker and so I'm like, well, can you take me this way, you know, to that gas station, that direction, because one, that's where I'm headed, and two, it's closer. He said, well, no, because that's outside of my jurisdiction. I'm going to have to take you back 20 miles to this other one. And I'm like, well, can you call somebody from the other side to come take me that way? Because I don't want to go back. <laughs> I don't that's, you know, I'm making great time. You know, I'm, I'm headed to my destination. I don't want to go back. Can you, can you call somebody? He's just like, well, no, I can't do that. Sometimes in our journey, when we, when we want it to be our plan, <laughs> you know, we're like, well, I'm, I'm right there. I want to, I want to, I want to go right there. But sometimes God is like, well, no, I'm, I'm going to need to take you back just a little bit take you back just a little bit because there's something that you might have missed. There's, there's something that I need you to, to see. Um, there's, 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 no, nah, that's not the plan. This is, this is what the plan is. And so I didn't understand it. I, I, was, I was so confused. So kind of moving on, I remember him taking me back. We went off the road, probably a mile or two into the desert. So now we're off the highway we're driving through, and I was I start praying again. We, I said, "Well, this is it. This is it. I'm, I'm gonna have to try to figure out a way to to break away from this guy who's about to try to sacrifice me or something. I'm not really sure what his plan is, but we going off the road. I'm trying to see the highway. I'm like, this is not this is not cool. Like, I don't know what's gonna happen." So we end up going to this little broke down gas station and I, I go in and this man has this huge dog that looked like a wolf just walking around the gas station. And the man looks scary. The officer drops me off. He's like, I'll come back and check on you. This is so-and-so, um, you know, you can wait here, you know, tell your, tell your people to pick you up here. <sighs> and so I waited. I was terrified, um, but I was safe. Sometimes God will put us in situations that are uncomfortable, that are unfamiliar, that we're looking around like, I have no idea <laughs> what's about to go down. But again, it's not, that's not our responsibility. Our responsibility is not to worry about it. Our responsibility is to trust. So moving forward, I end up getting picked up. I didn't die. He didn't bury me in the desert. Um, 
I, I make it out. I end up back at school and I go, I do my appeal. I do my part. And again, another hurdle arises. They say, you know what, Adrian, great job. We're going to let you back in school, but you can't stay in the dorm. So I said, well, where I'm, where I'm finna stay then? Because I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm thousands of miles away from home. Um, the school is really like on an island of, of a mountain. Uh, there's not much around. And so I'm like, okay, I'm gonna I'm figure this out some kind of way. <laughs> And so for the first semester of my senior year in college, after I made the commitment, after I said, yep, I'm going to do this, I'm, I'm going all in, I'm focused, yes, I'm, I'm going I'm to finish school, I'm going to go as far as I can, I was homeless. I stayed in the car. I stayed in the basement of the gym. I stayed in the locker room. Wherever else I could find to stay, I stayed. But each morning, I got up at 5 a.m. I ran to the gym, climbed through the window that I left cracked the night before. I would go in, I would take my shower, and I'd be at class bright and early because I was up. <laughs> but my focus was different. My focus, my focus was so different because I remember where I came from. I was reminded where I came from. I was reminded of the sacrifices that the people that came before me made. I was reminded of the cloth that I was cut from. I had this, I could do this. And when I walked across that stage at graduation, I remember winking at that professor who told me college wasn't for me. I gave him a little wink. It might have been petty, but I had to do it. <laughs> and so I, I finished my, my bachelor's degree. I went on and finished my master's degree. And then I, I entered into my, my doctoral program. And I had a newfound confidence. As I, as I moved on and I began um, wanting to speak to youth, I remember I, I met with a coach and uh, he got in the car, he got in my car, I met up with him in LA and he said, so what do you wanna talk about? What's gonna be your message? What's gonna, what is it gonna be that sets you apart? And so I started the typical stuff. I was like, oh, you know, I wanna, wanna motivate people. He was just like, yeah, no. <laughs> I was like, um, I want them to, want to help people overcome obstacles. He was like, no, nah, everybody does that. Everybody does that. And so I went and I kept naming things that were general. General. I wasn't minding my plan business. I was looking at what everybody else was doing and saying, I want to do that. I want to do that. I want to do that. And it's like, nah, nah. What makes you unique? What's going to make you stand out? How did you get from where you were to where you are? And so I started saying, I said, well, the first thing I did, I started going to class. And so he was like, okay, okay. He was like, what else? I said, well, I, I started behaving different. You know, I go to class, I started sitting in the front. Um, I, I, I started making sure I turned in all my work. Um, my mom will probably laugh at a story where I forget what grade I was in, but I was, I was having some issues. And we had a parent-teacher conference. And, you know, we had all these zeros on my grade sheet. And I, I still think the teacher might have put them there. Um, but there were some zeros on my grade sheet. And my mom was like, I know he did the work. <laughs> I saw him do the work. And we go home and we look at my backpack and we look at my desk and Lo and behold, somebody had put it in there and didn't turn it in. And, you know, you know, sometimes stuff happens and we don't know how, we don't know why, but 
it didn't get turned in. I started turning in my work. I started communicating with my professors. And so through everything that I went through, my test became my testimony. And in my youth mentoring program, the Heart Grove that my sister mentioned, um, I developed what I call my ABCs of success. And it was your attendance, your behavior, and your consistency and communication. Um, in addition to that, I, I added a few. And I feel like they apply to both school and life. And it's attendance and awareness, your belief and your behavior, and your consistency and communication. Now, how it applied to school was when I started going to every class, I didn't miss things. There were things that sometimes I would miss because I, I didn't show up. Um, my behavior changed. So I started sitting in the front of the class. One of the things that that did for me was I was easily distracted. I was always nervous. Um, that's why this whole thing is kind of kind of big for me because I didn't like being in front of people. I didn't want to be called on. I didn't want the teacher to ask me any questions. Um, I didn't want to raise my hand because I always felt like, what if, what if my answer is wrong? What if, what if they laugh? What if it's, you know, what if they chuckle at me? You know, you hear the snickling in, in class when you answer the question wrong. But one thing that I tell youth that I work with today is there's, there's no shame in not knowing, but there is in not finding out. We have no excuse. Um, with today's technology, I always ask the kids, if your phone stopped working right now, at what point would you give up trying to figure out how to get it back off? None. <laughs> None. And, and I found that actually doubt and fear are, are learned behaviors. They're learned behaviors. Last night, I had fun watching my niece, a Ray Ray, my ray of sunshine, doing her best to learn how to walk. And no matter how many times she failed, she always jumped back up. She never gave up, even, even when her walk was a little shaky, even when she didn't have the most confidence, at no point did she stop trying to walk. She never gave up. In addition to that, all of us in the room consistently and constantly screamed and cheered her on, even when she failed. As Christians, we have to stop looking down on each other when we fall and instead cheer them on, cheer each other on. It's okay, you failed, great job, you tried, you put forth your best effort. Get up, get back up, you can do it again. Um, as many times as I beat Q in basketball, he keeps coming back, he keeps trying, he never gives up. And after each game, as we're sitting on the bleachers talking, um, he's usually sweating harder than I am. But I always encourage him, hey, you're going to try again. It's going to be okay. And we have to continue to encourage each other in that manner. Um, and, and again, have faith in those around us. We have to be able to depend on each other. Um, but of course, most importantly, uh, depend on God. And how those ABCs um, have, have changed my life was, Again, my, my attendance, I showed up. I was aware there was an issue um, and I addressed it. My behavior changed. One second. Uh, my behavior changed. And so things started happening differently. People started looking at me differently. My professors started looking at me differently <laughs> because, because I started sitting in the front. Another thing sitting in the front did for me, it eliminated distractions. So those people who I would think were going to laugh at me or I, I thought they might, um, you know, snickle or I was worried about how they may look, I wasn't worried about him because I was focused on the teacher. It was just me and him as far as I was concerned. Sometimes we have to eliminate distractions and focus on God. We can't be worried about everybody else and what everybody else is doing. Um, because again, that's not part of our plan. Teacher had a specific plan for me. 
I had to communicate with him to figure out, you know what, how can I get a better grade in your class? I couldn't worry about how somebody else was going to get a better grade. I had to focus on, on my grades and my education and my relationship with that professor. Um, and so how I feel like that applies to our lives and our Christian walk, um, awareness and attendance. God put me where you want me to be. That has been my prayer ever since I graduated from college. God put me where you want me to be. Now, with that prayer comes a lot of faith and trust because there have been a few times where, where I wanted me to be and where I wanted him to want me to be weren't the same as where he wanted me to be. So when I graduated, I worked at some group homes. I had done all kinds of things. And when I returned to Alabama in 2019, I was like, I am done with group homes. I am done with having to come in and cover shifts because staff called off. I'm, I'm done with kids fighting. And, you know, I was like, I want to be in education. I want to I want to be a college professor. That's why I went, you know, continued on for my doctor. So I applied at Alabama a and I applied at Drake. I applied at Calhoun. I applied at UAH and I got interviews and I killed them. I walked out of the interviews and they were like, oh, Adrian, we love it. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Everything. And I'm just like, oh, yeah, Professor Adrian, I'm ready. Professor Hargrove. And then I ended up at Harris Home. And I was just like, well, God, um, remember the plan we talked about? This ain't it. I don't, <laughs> this is not the plan. And, and he reminded me, for I know the plan I have for you. And so there was a few times I was like, well, is you gonna tell me or you want me to just, <laughs> just kind of keep doing this faith thing? And he's just like, just trust me and relax. And so I've been trusting his plan. God put me where you want me to be. We have to ask God to put us where he wants us to be, not just where we want to be. Now we can share it. We can share what we might want. Just like I remember my daughter sometimes might tell me what she want to eat. And I'm like, okay, I might consider that, but no, nah. you know, because otherwise it'd be pizza and, and chicken nuggets all the time. Um, I changed my belief and my behavior. That's my B. Uh, with God and individuals, oh no, I skipped one. Your inner belief will reflect your outward behavior. Say it again. Your inner belief will reflect or will influence, I should say, your outward behavior. Once your belief system changes, your behavior will change. If when I didn't believe I belonged in college, when I didn't believe that I could do well, my behavior reflected that belief. I didn't go to class. I didn't turn in all of, all of my assignments. So much starts in our mind, and, and those are things that I tie into my, my mental health talks with my youth. If you don't believe it, it's not gonna really matter. Nothing else is gonna come forward. That's why God says, believe in me. If you don't believe in him, then your behavior is not gonna reflect that belief. You're gonna worry, you're gonna stress because you don't believe. Um, I, I have a funny analogy and I won't say I think it, it might offend, but I think it's hilarious. As Christians, when we worry, doubt and stress about the things on this earth, um, I see right now there's 74 people on, on, on here. I'm pretty sure that all 74, does that include me? Am I 75? Okay. I'm sure that all of us <laughs> on here believe that Jesus is coming again to, to take us to heaven, right? We all believe that. For those of you on, you nod your head. You believe he's going to take you to heaven. We believe that there are going to be streets of gold. We believe it's going to be, you know, the, the, the milk and honey. We're going to have wings. We're going to live forever. We believe all that, right? But you don't believe he's going to help you pay the utility bill. 
Make it make sense. Make it make sense. We believe we're going to fly, but you don't believe he's going to help you find a new job. You believe we're going to walk on streets of gold and live forever, but you don't believe that he can heal our bodies. Make it make sense, people. Um, <laughs> somebody said their toes got stepped on. <laughs> but but it's true. It's really true. And and I had those were things that I had to come to grip with myself when I when I was in school and, and when I was stressed out about so many different things. It was just like, why why am I stressing out if I'm saying I believe? Um, in the in the last one, our C consistency and communication. I had to start communicating with my professors. I, after class, you know, I had to start going to them and, and saying, hey, I'm, I'm having a problem with this assignment. I'm, I'm not completely understanding. Um, I, I need a little bit more help. We have to consistently communicate with God in our, in our walk with him in, in life. That's where prayer comes in. That's where conversation comes in. And I think I think sometimes we even misinterpret what prayer is. Prayer is a conversation. Prayer doesn't always necessarily mean you got to drop down to your knees and all that. Again, I talk to God like that's my boy. When I'm driving in the car, I'll just be talking. I'll be like, man, I'm stressed today. <laughs> I'm stressed out. I don't want to go to work. And we have a conversation. I don't necessarily have to say, okay, well, when I get home, I'm going to get on my knees and pray about it. We talk. If we look at the Bible, there were times that Jesus got on his knees and, and prayed, but we look, they say he walked and talked. He walked and talked with Adam in the garden. From the beginning, that was his plan. His plan wasn't always, all right, Adam, get on your knees and pray to me. No. He walked and talked. We have to actually develop a relationship with God. And if we think about it in our walk, and, and this is me about our community, our, 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 our Black community, I was going to say it. <laughs> um, we have to develop relationships with people. I was just talking to someone this week, and they're trying to put forth a community effort. And he was just like, well, I'm having a hard time getting the community involved. And I said, you're not in the community. That's the problem. You're not in the community. I tell my staff at work, the kids will believe more of what they see than what they hear. Are you in the community? I, I, I drive through the, the Northwood housing projects. There are several times that I will drive by and the kids on the basketball court will wave me down. And I'll turn around, go up the street, take off my suit jacket, go out on the court and play basketball with them for a few minutes. You have to be in the community. God has given me so many opportunities this year that I would have never expected. I've had people call me asked me to do things, asked me to be involved in initiatives. And in my mind, I still don't know how it happened. I do a little bit on social media, but it's not as much as some of my counterparts. And I had gotten discouraged about that. I was just like, man, I'm not doing enough videos. I'm not, I'm not posting enough. I'm not, I'm not doing the plan that so-and-so is doing. But what God has reminded me this year is that's not my plan for you. You do what I told you to do. You follow your plan. You take your bells, you look at your sheet of music, and you play when you're supposed to play. Don't worry about when they're playing. Because if you keep looking over there and you're trying to play when they're playing, you're going to mess the song up. You're going to mess up the song. Your gift will make room for you. Thank you, Mama. Your gift will make room for you. What gift did God give you specifically? We all say we believe God don't make no mistakes. So why in the world do we keep trying to use somebody else's gift? 
again, if we trust and believe and he gave you a gift, then you have to believe that the gift you needed, that he, I mean, the gift that he gave you is something that's needed. You are needed. You are unique. Um, <laughs> some of the ham pills. <laughs> um, but it, it, it all makes sense when we simplify it. Again, I think working with youth has been great for me um, because you have to simplify things. And I think what happens as adults, we kind of get full of ourselves and we try to make stuff deep. And it ain't. I love Jesus so much because he was so simple. <laughs> and we try to complicate it. And again, being a parent <laughs> helped me understand that. Because I'll tell, you know, you tell your child something and they just make it so much harder than it's got to be. And you're like, I just told you to do that. Well, well, but what about, I didn't, I just told you to do that. I didn't tell you to do all this other stuff. You know, right, right now at Harris Home in my, in my building, I think I got 16 kids. And it's so many times that I'll hear things. And, and, and I also, I understand why God wants me there. One, to change lives, but also so he can keep me focused on his plan for me. Because there's so many times that I will tell, well, okay, so this is how he works. Because again, we have a unique relationship. So sometimes I'll pray about something and I will ask a question and I'll feel like God's not answering my prayer. Usually that same day, I'll have a kid come to my office door and ask me something that I think is so, I don't wanna say stupid, but I'll kind of sit back and look at him like, did you really just ask me that? And then I'll remind him of what I said. And then he's like, oh, you did say that. And he goes on about his business. Usually once that happened, a light bulb goes off about my prayer. And then I'll sit back and say, oh, you did say that. And then I go on and handle my business. I think so many times we just, we try to overcomplicate, you know, what God means and what he says. It's very simple. Trust me, love one another and share my love. It's really that simple. If we if we follow those things, um, um, life life will be so much easier. Now, again, we're talking about mental health, and so I want to, as I come to a close, <laughs> um, kind of touch on some of the things because again, we we want to be physically, spiritually mentally and also emotionally healthy. Um, and I feel like God gives us the tools to do all of that. So what does God say about worry and stress? And what also, how does it affect our body? So Philippians 4, 6, and I, I'm gonna paraphrase some of these if, if you want a second to find it. I don't know how that works on Zoom, uh, <laughs> but I guess you can maybe give a thumbs up. Um, but I'm gonna run through a few. And for the sake of time, we want to just jot down the, the scriptures. Um, that'll be fine too. But paraphrasing, Philippians 6, 4 verse 6 says, do not be anxious about anything. Um, Matthew 6, 25 says, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than clothes. Uh, Matthew 6, 27, can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? I haven't. <laughs> um, worrying and stressing does nothing for us. It actually impacts our health in a very negative way. I looked up on, on the web a few ways that worrying and stress impact our bodies. And more specifically, as African-Americans, how those things affect our bodies. Um, so it says that stress itself is related to illness and longevity. 
Members of the African, African American community are at risk of experiencing higher levels of stress, either at given points or cumulatively over time. That greater exposure to stress accounts for a substantial portion of the health disadvantage of African Americans in the minority community. Now it says stress may be defined as environmental demands that tax or exceed the adaptive capacity of an organism resulting in biological and psychological changes that may be detrimental and place the organism at risk of disease. So just by worrying and stressing, we're making ourselves more at, or we're increasing our risk of disease and health problems. It affects our nervous system. This messaging network is made up of your brain, spinal cord, nerves, and special cells called neurons. Worrying too much can trigger, can trigger it to release stress hormones that speed up your heart rate and breathing, raise your blood sugar, and send more blood to your arms and legs. Over time, this can affect your heart, blood vessels, muscles, and other systems. It affects your muscles. When you're troubled by something, the muscles in your shoulder and neck can tense up, and that can lead to migraines or tension or tension headaches. Um, it says massage relaxation techniques like deep breathing and yoga may help. It affects your breathing. If you're worried a lot, you might breathe more deeply and more often without realizing it. Realizing it. While this usually isn't a big deal, it can be serious if you already have breathing problems linked to asthma, lung disease, and other conditions. With this COVID going around that affects our lungs and, and other areas, that could be huge. How along with that and the worrying can affect those parts of our bodies. It affects our hearts. If it sticks around long enough, something as small as a nagging concern in the back of your mind can affect your heart. It can make you more likely to have high blood pressure, high blood pressure, a heart attack, or a stroke. Higher levels of anxiety can trigger those stress hormones that make your heart beat faster and harder. If that happens over and over, your blood vessels may get inflamed, which can lead to hardened artery walls, unhealthy cholesterol levels, and other problems. We are killing ourselves by stressing out. We are killing ourselves by worrying about the plan that God has already said he's taken care of. And if we believe like we say we believe, I know it's easier said than done, but we gotta stop stressing ourselves out. We gotta stop stressing ourselves out. And what I've learned to do is when I do feel stressed, because one of the things that I tell people in my anger management class, in my emotional management class, what I call it, because it's all the emotions. We get angry, you, you cry, you get happy, you, it's all emotions. And the idea is for us not to try to present ourselves from having them, but to embrace them and just learn how to manage them better. Because um, I said, nobody says anything wrong about you being happy, but you can't get happy and do certain things because it, it still be a problem. You know, I, I can be happy, but I can't just go running through the store and, and knocking stuff off the shelf just because I'm happy. Um, or I can't just run up and start hugging people because um, some people might take that the wrong way. So, <laughs> um, but we have to, we have to trust our, we have to trust in God's plan for us. And once we're following that plan, we have to mind our plan business. And last but not least, we, we have to move. We have to move. A, a good friend of mine um, developed a, a program and she stresses moving, uh, moving physically as in exercising and also moving as a mission. Um, again, as Black History Month, 
it was called a civil rights movement. They didn't just sit still. They were aware of an issue. Their belief in their behavior affected or their belief impacted how they behaved. And they were consistent in communicating the physical aspects as well as the mental aspects of the movement. Um, Pastor, I, I, I'm, I, I don't want to make a, a, a complete statement because I'm not 100% sure, but almost every miracle that I can recall, at least the ones in the primary treasure, called for somebody to move. I don't remember, and I could be wrong, I don't remember Jesus ever yanking somebody up when he said, take up your bed and walk. They had to do something, which actually began with their belief. So if God tells you to take up your bed and walk, you got to first believe in what he said before your outward behavior is going to reflect that belief. So if you're praying for something or when we're praying for something, because um, like I said, we'd be, we be talking, um, Whatever it is we're praying for, sometimes we need to ask God, was it, what is it that I need to do? What's my part in the plan? You, okay, Lord, I, I might not have the entire plan, but right now, what is it that I need to do? So if, if that person who was laying there on that bed had this plan in their life, and they're like, you know what, I want to go out and, and do this. I want to go out and do that. And he's like, well, God, how am I going to do all these things that I want to do with my life? He says, well, first, you got to take up your bed and walk. First, you got to go to class. <laughs> you know, first, you got to have an awareness. You got to start believing and you got to start behaving different. So if you're feeling like your prayers aren't being answered, you got to look inward sometimes and say, how, how, am, I, how am I behaving that might be affecting whether or not this prayer is being answered. I had a pastor tell me just last month, he said, Adrian, you keep saying you're waiting on God, but God has been waiting on you. He's like, he's already, <laughs> the plan is already laid out. He's waiting on you to, to take the first step. And as I started taking those steps, opportunities started to come. As I started spending more time with him and making notes and working on a curriculum and, and actually putting down notes for my mentoring program, I started getting calls from schools for a mentoring program. It wasn't, I get a call from a school about a mentoring program and then I put the mentoring program together. It was put the mentoring program together and then schools will start calling you for the gift that I've given you. So sometimes God is waiting for you to do what you said you wanted to do so that he can put you in the position to carry out that flavor into the world. And again, we got to put in the work. Put in the work for the things that you're saying you want to do. If I want to be a pilot, I don't need to be sitting working with a plumber. I don't want a pilot that went to school for plumbing. I don't want to get on that plane. I don't want a pilot who hasn't been through some turbulence. We have to go through things. Had I not gone through the things that I went through, I wouldn't be able to talk to the young men and women that I talk to now from my experiences. As my sister read in my bio, I pull from my experiences. If you don't know where you came from, you don't know where you're capable of going. So I can tell a young man, hey, this is how that's going to play out <laughs> if you keep doing that, because I can pull from my experiences now. I can talk about having my heart broken. I can talk about failing a class. I can talk about getting in trouble for not turning my work in. I can talk about what happens if you're not being consistent in communicating with your professors or your teachers. I can talk about those things because I had to go through it. 
So when you're going through things or as we've gone through things or as we look at our experiences in life, look at those as badges of honor. Look at those as, you know what? That's something else God has trusted me with to give a testimony to somebody else. It's not about us. It's about the others. It's about the world. Again, it's about that flavor that we can give to the world. And I think sometimes we get so caught up in, in me, 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 me. Well, what about me, Lord? And he's like, I, I, I told you, I already got you. But there's some other people that I need you to reach that only you can reach. And he's not going to wait. That's something else I've learned. When he's giving you something, he's not going to wait. If, if that mission is for you to, to reach these people over here and you decide you just want to sit on it, he's got some other people too that he's given skills. It might not be the way you could have done it, but then we can't get mad when we're working, when we're working together as a church community, um, being a supervisor, being an administrator. I'm really big on team. As, a, as an athlete, I'm really big on team. And one of the things that really frustrates me is when people on the same team forget why they're playing in the first place. It's not about you. It's not about, you know, I played basketball. So it's, it's not about how many points you score. It's not about how many shots you get. At the end of the day is that the team wins because everybody gets a ring. In life, everybody gets a crown when we get to the heaven that, that we say and we believe in. So when we're working as a church family, don't get so caught up in your stats. Don't get so caught up in, the oh, I want the ball. It doesn't matter. Play your role. <laughs> Do what you're good at. You might not be able to be the choir director because you got this thing with your, with your ear and, and then what comes out, it don't all go the same. It, they don't work well together. You might not be able to be the choir director. <laughs> you might not need to be in the choir, but you might be a great writer, write a song. I'm not the most organized person in the world. <laughs> so I don't really like to be organizer. I like to have somebody who does that for me. Because that's the, yeah, you do that a lot better. Again, um, to kind of jump back, I remember a conversation with, uh, with Eric, Eric Thomas um, and how he was saying one of the things that has gotten him to where he is, and it's, it's public knowledge, so I could say it, he's at about $75,000 per hour at this point to speak. $75,000 thousand dollars to speak for an hour and one of the things he was explaining on his on his rise was that the people he put around him were experts in what they did he said i speak <laughs> i have somebody who's an expert at social media they run my media side of things i have a person who's an expert at this area. I have a person who's an expert in curriculums. They do that and together we're able to carry our message out to the world. As a church, we have to embrace our experts. So just because someone is doing something a little bit better than you doesn't mean that you have to throw shade or look at them sideways like well, she thinks she all that. He thinks he all that. They are because that's how God created them to be. <laughs> And you are all that too in what you're all that in, what he created you to be. And together, we can reach so many more people. So my, my call to action for us as a church community, as a African-American community, is to let's be aware of the issues that are at hand. Let's be in attendance. Let's show up. Let's ask God to put us where he wants us to be. Let's actually act like we believe the stuff we say we believe. Because um, we say it, but we don't mean it. I, I think sometimes it's just a little cliche. We just, oh, I believe in God. Do you? Do you? 
I think Q believes he can beat me, and that's great. That's a great belief. It ain't going to happen, but it's a great belief to have. But, but our behavior has to, has to reflect that. Um, I, I, I love to smile. I love to laugh. I love to joke. And it bothers me when I see Christians just looking down and sad. Like that, that just doesn't, um, that it doesn't make sense to me. If, if we have this word of God and we have this belief that in the end, uh, we're going to, we're going to have all these great things. Why, why are we worried? Why are we stressed? Again, I love food. If, if I'm, if I'm headed to my mom's house and I know she made some broccoli casserole, why am I stressed? I might be hungry, but I'm not worried. She already, she told me it's already made. If my, if, if my dad just made the lemon pepper chicken wings that he makes and I'm driving out to, to harvest, why am I worried? Even though that feeling of hunger might be there, I'm not worried about it because he says, hey, I already made the, yeah, I made it. I made the chicken. It's an oven. It's done. Mom says, hey, the, ca the casserole's already done. Oh, my sister makes the most phenomenal chicken on the grill that, that there is. It's already made, so why are you stressed? So if God is saying to us, salvation is already taken care of. I died for you. I, I died so that you can live. Why are we worried? Now it's just our time to do what it is we're supposed to do. It's time for us to move. And so my call to action again to us is as we leave today, as you go about your daily lives, act like you are saved. Act like there is a heaven that we have to look forward to. We gotta stop walking around looking all gloomy. We can't, we can't walk around looking around just all, woe is me. Because I'm gonna be honest, I'm not gonna wanna hear what you gotta say. <laughs> if, if someone, again, Let's talk about a restaurant and food. I just got to jump right back in it because I love it. If someone is telling you about a restaurant or about a concert or about a music artist and they don't seem excited, are you going to want to go eat there? Are you going to want to listen to it? If they're like, yeah, you know, this is a restaurant. It's new. It's open. The food is good. It's like the best food there is. I'm be like, you don't sound too convincing. <laughs> and every time I see you, you just look, mm -hmm. you don't look too excited. But if you're walking around and you look full and you look excited and you're happy and you're saying, hey, there's this restaurant, <laughs> man, let me tell you about it. Now you're like, oh, tell where, what they got? Your whole attitude changes. Their whole attitude changed. They're like, wait, no, tell me more. Tell me more. In my speaking academy, that was one of the first lessons we learned was you have to have people that say, you have to get people to say, tell me more. When we're talking about God, one, you don't want to bombard people with everything at one time. You can't take it. It's like trying to eat too much. You got to do it in, in portions. But you want people to be like, hey, tell me more. And if you're all distressed and you're all gloomy and everything is negative and it's worry and it's stress and it's, don't nobody want to hear that. Just going, just going to be completely honest. Nobody wants to hear that. Nobody's going to want to come to your church. Nobody's going to come to our functions or events because y'all don't look happy. <laughs> y'all don't look excited about what you're talking about. So why would I want to come there? We are the flavor. We are the flavor. We, we can't be bland. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for waking us up this morning. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to be the flavor of this world. Thank you for giving us all an individual music sheet, an individual 
handbell that we will play in, in your timing that will create a great sound that'll carry out the music of your word to the world. As we leave today, we ask you to encourage us, encourage those of us that, that are stressed and worried, and let us remember that you've already taken care of everything. And that only we need at this point is to move. Move in the direction that, that you've already planned out for us, follow the blueprint, and that everything is gonna be taken care of. And we'll, in the end, get to go home with you, have some great food and listen to some great music and tell our story of how we overcame. In Jesus' name, amen.